I'd like now to introduce our keynote speaker, Chloe Bass. We asked Chloe to join us today because she's an artist working in, in, in an intersection between many of the ideas we had about this conference. She is an artist and a professor, a New York City native who grew up in our museums. As the current situation has become what it is, we've noted our own fears of going outside, the need for sympathy, and the need to stay engaged with others. We had promised her a cab ride in from home for the conference, but she's since relocated to an undisclosed location with her family and the cab ride became too expensive. Instead, she, like all of us, has adjusted to extended home life and joining us virtually. After her talk, we have plenty of time for Q&A. I will be moderating, so please add some questions to the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. I'm excited now to bring her up on stage. Please welcome Chloe Bass. Welcome. Good morning. Um, thank you so much to Nick Murr for inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, thank you to Brian for all of his amazing spearheading of the technological shift, to Charlotte for all of her work and care for the people who are providing closed captions so that uh, more people can enjoy this from home. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you all. I'm speaking to you today, not from New York City, where I normally live and was also born and raised, but from St. Louis, Missouri, where I've been sheltering in place with my partner and his son since March 22nd. I'm happy to say that for now, we are safe and healthy and among the other complex emotions of this time, relatively happy. And I hope that you are as well, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. So first, I wanted to start with a little bit of background about me. I'm an assistant professor in studio art at Queens College, City University of New York, where I co-direct Social Practice Queens. Social Practice Queens is a pedagogical project integrating studio-based artistic work with social, tactic, interventionist, and cooperative forms. Um, I'm gonna start my screen share so that you can see a slide that shares our book, Art as Social Action. So you should be able to see our book cover art as social action on the screen. Um, this book contains essays, interviews, lesson plans, and uh, other information about how to teach socially engaged art and was the first formal book with lesson plans released of its kind. We released that book in 2018. I am also, in addition to being a professor, perhaps primarily an artist. Um, my work uses daily life as a site of deep research to address scales of intimacy, where patterns hold and break as group sizes expand. I began my work with a focus on the individual, doing a project called the Bureau of Self-Recognition from 2011 to 2013. I recently concluded a study of pairs called the Book of Everyday Instruction, which I did from 2015 to 2018. And now I'm in process with a project observing immediate families, called Obligation to Others Holds Me in My Place, a research project that will run from 2018, probably until 2022. I had initially said 2021, but my plans have significantly changed as a large portion of this project involves making an experimental documentary film that requires travel to produce. My first shoot was scheduled for March 20th of 2020 in Lexington, Kentucky, so you can imagine that did not happen on schedule. I will continue to scale up my inquiries and research very gradually until I'm working at, with intimacy at the scale of the metropolis. I've recently started to call myself an arts-based researcher, someone who uses the arts to come to understand the human condition, the impact of daily behavior on public policy, and the ways in which we see or fail to see a world or the uh, see or fail to see the world around us can have consequences that reach far beyond our own individual or family lives. The title of this talk, I want us to look more closely, was actually uh, something that I put on the marquee of the Knockdown Center, an amazing art center in Maspeth, Queens. The words I want us to look more closely serve as both a command and an invitation. What if we looked closely at our lives and began to acknowledge that even the tiniest moments are a form of making meaning. This seems especially important right now as we're faced with very, very many tiny moments in our home and an extremely large moment happening beyond our walls. 
It's important for me to tell you that I am not currently, nor have I ever been a museum educator. I don't actually use the word educator to describe myself, although I do spend a lot of my life teaching and both of my parents have been or still are teachers. My father teaches at the new school in the philosophy department and my mother actually worked as a museum educator and teaching artist at the Metropolitan Museum and the Children's Museum of Manhattan, both before I was born and while I was a young child. The context that I want to give you about myself is this. I come to you today as someone who has attended and received information from museums, not as someone who initiates or manages them. Another way to put this is that this is a speech written not by an expert in your field, but by someone who might be in your classroom or someone who might have been in your classroom in the past. Listen to it like this. I am or could be the manifestation of one of your students. While I wouldn't and don't claim that teaching is part of my art practice, I do find overlaps between the work that I want to make in the classroom and the works that I want to present in the world. It seems both inevitable and reasonable in this moment to begin to question everything, a practice that I admit is actually common for me in almost any moment, not just during a crisis. In art, as an education, a good way to get an unfamiliar audience to look more closely at a thing is to start by asking a question. In art, I use questions to bring other people into my practice as quickly as possible. As a conceptual artist who works in complex, often ephemeral forms, yet with a practice that undeniably requires the participation of other people in any number of ways, as interview subjects, as co-hosts, as players, as collaborators, I often walk the line between being totally approachable and totally confusing. Giving people a familiar form, the question, as a way to engage with the project is one way to be sure that someone will engage with the project. When someone asks a question, you give an answer even if the answer is that you don't know the answer. My current project, Wayfinding, which you can see now in the slide, which is presented through the Studio Museum in Harlem and actually miraculously remains on view in Harlem St. Nicholas Park, even during this period of physical distancing, centers itself around three major questions presented at a monumental scale, billboard scale to be precise. The three questions of the project are, how much of life is coping? How much of care is patience? And how much of love is attention? Coping seems particularly uh, resonant with people in this moment. I've received a lot of feedback from people on Instagram saying like, yeah, a lot of life is coping in ways that we are increasingly aware of. My project asks these three questions honestly, but also uses them as a jumping off point to investigate spaces of intimacy and loss within immediate families, to frame the relationship between people and cities as inherently familial, and to assess the impact of rapid, ur rapid urban development and gentrification-based displacement on people who are suffering from conditions of memory loss, particular Alzheim particularly Alzheimer's disease. This project is actually dedicated to my grandmother, who passed away from Alzheimer's complications in December of 2018. I was happy to be able to share the opening of this, my first solo museum exhibition with my grandfather, who unfortunately passed away only three weeks ago. Um, although not from COVID-19, I think that he was truly dismayed at the age of 97 by the isolation of this recent time. The questions that I ask in my project both stand on their own and serve as gateways to other forms of information, other ways to interact, other ways to think, other ways to move, and other ways to be. The inquiry-based approach in art has been useful as I refine my teaching practice as well. Both teaching an assumption of who my students are, what they believe, and what they know, and teaching in opposition or defense to things that I fear in advance that they may not believe or roll with, have demonstrated themselves to me to be unhelpful at best and problematic at worst. 
In order to learn who the people with me in the classroom actually are, I ask. When I feel that something is too quickly presumed to be shared, when in fact we haven't set the terms for its meaning, I ask. So today I am asking you questions that are less poetic, but no less important. What is a museum? What is education? It's a funny moment to introduce these particularly in particular inquiries. I am sensitive to the fact that many among us may be or have been laid off or furloughed from their professional abilities to engage these same questions in the way that you might normally. But I also believe that it's in this period of stressful pause that we actually have the ability to question what we may have been unnecessarily and quietly accepting for a very long time. This is a quote uh, that I'm going to share with you in a minute, but Leslie Jameson, in her recent article, Other Voices, Other Rooms, for the New York Review of Books, asks, what belongs in a museum anyway? An epic landscape painting? Sure. A crib? A baby? A photograph of a crib and a baby? Though we often understand art as representation, it actually operates through exclusion and distortion. Art changes the world, distills it, transforms it, and rejects it in order to focus and electrify our attention. Beauty rises from what feels recognizable and far away at once. The craggy mountain glowing with human love, the crib in its white-walled gallery. Art doesn't just replicate our lives. Its force lives in its acts of framing and reimagining, its juxtapositions, and as artist Leah Lublin puts it, its displacements. Jameson's essay, which opens up essential questions about the museum as a space of everyday life, is nominally a review of an exhibition of home movies, private lives, public spaces, at the currently closed Museum of Modern Art. While the essay is beautiful, it fails to mention what MoMA has decided, at least for the foreseeable future, doesn't belong in the museum its educators, all of whom had their contracts terminated as of April 2020. Some of you may be among us today. If I'm speaking about you, please feel free to weigh in during the question and answer period. As a person who received a lot of education through museums, I feel both eager and obliged to reflect on the many things that they've given me. The image that you see right now on the screen is a series of diagram, diagrammatic photographs that I made depicting four phases of love that a person might be in between themselves and an institution. From left, they are, nobody loves me. Second from left, the impossible fairy tale, uh, which is two people fall in love, encounter adversity, triumph, and live happily ever after. Third from left, we tried to love each other, but it didn't work out. And fourth from left, I love somebody, but it's not requited. Of course, these are not the only phases of love, but they're four that I wanted to demonstrate. As a child, I found the museum to be a space of play. Of course, this is not guaranteed for all children. We know that as in any public space or space designed for public good, some people are more welcome and have more access than others. And those who are not welcomed often feel it acutely. As a young adult, I embraced the museum as one of the few spaces where I could feel alone or even quietly be with friends and often also be inside. The museum had the prescient quality that a bar might take on later, and thanks to early 2000s partnerships between New York City public schools and many, many amazing institutions, museums were free. As an adult, I've used museums as spaces for dates, sources of income, places to be with and simultaneously escape my own students, and so much more. For a long time, at least in Western culture, we've believed that we might receive from a museum an assessment of public good or an evaluation that something is of quality. This feels not so different in, the, in this moment from assessing metrics of public health. A museum being good might be an indicator that its corresponding culture is also good. As culture is good, so too the people. In this moment, our way of putting that is if the curve is flattened, 
bring on the rise of the economy. Of course, many thinkers, including the exceptional Laura Reykjavik, who is currently serving as interim executive director of the Leslie Lohman Museum, and whom I'm delighted to call a friend, have questioned whether museums truly can or do hold any sort of societal diagnostic space. In her March 2020 article for Freeze, Reykjavik writes, for museums to become more equitable spaces, the structures and histories that underpin them must be confronted, starting with recognizing that museums have never been neutral. This necessary evolution is not a transition towards an ideology, but rather a recognition of past and current ideological frameworks that are unjust and exclusionary. Among the thorniest aspects of this undoing is how culture is funded, in part because the power relationships embedded in museums, especially in the United States, mirror the yawning gap in wealth and privilege between an increasingly exclusive minority and the vast majority of society. That culture is dependent on this small group, as magnanimous as it might be, is problematic. Reykjavik's article puts emphasis on sources of funding, an argument with which I strongly agree, but from which I wish to deviate to an emphasis on social role the role which education has long played a large and in my recent museum experiences, particularly increasingly larger part. What does it mean to convene a museum educators roundtable at a time when major museums, MoMA is not alone in this, are laying off their education staff? Some with the claim that revenue losses mean that they no longer know when education will ever be part of the museum's plan again. What kind of precedent does it set for our society to say that cultural good no longer involves the active support and production of pedagogy? I don't know you and I don't wanna assume what you do, but I can say this with a relative level of confidence. Sorry, I'm gonna get back to the right slide. Thanks for bearing with me. I don't know you and I don't wanna assume what you do, but I can say this with a relative level of confidence. We are, I think, all people whose livelihoods were predicated on and held up by huge amounts of direct interpersonal contact that have now been taken away. What I want to make clear is that even before this pandemic moment, our access to the social, which we possibly took for granted or even from time to time found exhausting, truly set us apart from the living and working experiences of many Americans. These past weeks, most other workers who spend large amounts of face-to-face -face time with a wide range of people have been deemed essential. Medical professionals, caregivers, and those who can ensure that we still access food. I am not ignoring just to say the huge numbers of invisible workers whose labor makes that other essential work possible. Cleaning staff, transit workers, etc. But here I want to raise a kind of false comparison question. What if what was deemed essential was measured entirely through its level of social contact rather than through the performance of specific skill sets or the provision of primary needs like food, healthcare, and shelter? In other words, what if educators became essential workers too? At least in my narrow channels of social media, news media, and inbox, a lot has been asked about the role of the artist during this time. A lot has also been stated about the difficulty of being a teacher or the failures of the move to online education, which in my own experience have been many. But no one, at least no one that I've seen, has questioned the role of either the educator or the museum as we enter an uncertain, uncertain future. What is it that we are supposed to model? What do we find ourselves modeling accidentally or worse, find ourselves being used to model by the institutions that claimed to protect us. I found through other elements of my artistic work that in the realm of human intimacy, no space is too small to question. My project, the Bureau of Self-Recognition, from which you can see one sample exercise on the screen right now, opened with a question that I was genuinely asking myself at the time. What are three things that you do every day? When I started the Bureau of Self-Recognition in 2011, I was suffering from a postgraduate school uh, 
you know, about to enter my late twenties, pretty understandable mix of anxiety and excitement. And I found it hard to concentrate on almost anything. In asking myself to document three things every day, I realized that the practice of accumulation that I was going through might be beneficial for other people as well. So I started a program called Free Consultations. While I am not now, nor have I ever been a therapist, I'm interested in procedures like therapy that allow people to understand a social project as a kind of participatory game. On the screen, you can see the first exercise that I gave to the people who uh, were my patients at the time. Exercise one, you can record all observations in your desired format. Look in the mirror. Please make a record after five seconds of staring at the image in the mirror. Make a second record after 15 seconds of staring, a third after 30 seconds, a fourth after one minute. Keep making records until you feel finished. Guiding questions. What is your first reaction? What is the first physical behavior that you notice? How does this exercise change over time? Is this you? I wound up working with 26 different people, some of whom I had known beforehand and some of whom I didn't, to do a series of exercises that they conducted over the course of a month. People submitted their responses to me in writing, photographs, videos, audio files, and other forms, which became a huge collection of material that I eventually showcased as part of the Bureau of Self-Recognition exhibition. Asking yourself, what are three things you do every day? At least when you're teaching, you know that you did something. What did I do today? I taught. Something happened. Particularly during these strange days of inside time, that kind of consistency and social awareness is actually being reconfigured as remarkable. Minutes take on new minute, new meaning during this period. In normal life, I can find myself tuning out, skimming through books that I've taught for what feels like 1,000 semesters, glossing over lessons that I impart while no longer holding on to the sparkle of wonder that comes from learning something for the first time. But now I wonder what happens when it all becomes new again? Will the first steps be glorious or afraid? After the Bureau of Self-Recognition, I conducted a project called the Book of Everyday Instruction, which was an eight chapter project about one-on-one -on -one social interaction. You can see on the screen now an installation view from chapter one, You and Me Together. Each chapter of the project focused on its own central question, which was available both publicly as a kind of title and also privately as a way of guiding my research and activities as I did the work. Chapter one's central question was, and particularly striking during this time, how do we know when we're really together? I conducted chapter one of the Book of Everyday Instruction in, in Cleveland, which was a place that I had never been until I took on this work. I asked people in Cleveland who I met largely online through places like Craigslist if I could join them in their everyday life for an activity that they normally did with a different partner. I said that I was open to doing anything other than something that was sexual in nature. The idea is that I would meet them at the normal time that they did their activity, in the normal place where they did their activity, and I would replace their usual partner so they would swap out that person with me. I wanted to call attention to the ways in which just bringing in a new person allows us to have a heightened awareness of the things that we do oftentimes without thinking. But I also wanted to invite this, the answer to this question, how do we know when we're really together? We know that it's not just when we're in the same room or doing the same thing, that there are myriad complexities to tracking this sort of time and the feelings that it brings. I wound up joining 16 different people I did not formally document the process of being with them, but rather um, I shared uh, small instant photographs that were a kind of visual note taking that I later, later framed within larger digital photographs. Each small photograph held in my own hand, the environment behind them, my immediate Cleveland environment. The caption that you see is part of the diptych. So it's a text and photo diptych. Each caption describes what was happening to the best of my recollection in the moment where the instant photograph was originally taken. This was from a day that I spent with a teenage girl named Heather. 
um, the things that she normally did with her friends were hang out and talk about boys. So we did the same. It was a very enjoyable afternoon. I wanted to combine these photos and texts as a way of understanding fleeting moments where we feel connected, even if they ultimately don't mean anything or are difficult to even remember. For chapter three of the Book of Everyday Instruction, the chapter title being, We Walk the World Two by Two, I wanted to ask the question, how do we build a place through shared labor over time? I was invited to Greensboro, North Carolina through an amazing living museum called Elsewhere and through the funding of Art Place America to create a permanent public project along Greensboro's South Elm Street. Because I was still working in the format of pairs, I decided that I wanted to interview people who had a shared work or life history on South Elm Street for a long period of time. Um, the youngest organization that I interviewed was actually the museum itself, which has existed since 2003. I was also able to speak with someone who was 84 years old, as well as to the man that you see in the photograph, along with his family, about living and working on South Elm Street since the early 1980s. This project took place in 2015 and 16. I turned the interviews that I did about shared histories of life and work into permanent historic plaques documenting moments that otherwise might not go recognized in a public format. This man is Jerry Leimenstahl, and his plaque reads, for 10 years, four times a day, Jerry Leimenstahl and his family's dog, Watson, took long walks through downtown Greensboro. After Watson died, strangers would stop Jerry to ask where the dog was, sometimes crying when they heard he had passed. Their walks were part of this neighborhood. In this photograph, you can see Mary Wells. Uh, Mary's antique store actually closed because she retired about a year after the plaque went up, but I'm happy to say that the plaque remains on the building. Mary's plaque reads, in this store, Mary Wells has encouraged visitors to touch objects for the past 46 years. She relates to furniture as though it were people, telling us about, the, about history through the feel of wood or glass. The store has also served as a second home for Mary's two daughters. There are four plaques in total documenting lots of different kind of shared work and life experiences. And I'm proud to leave these tiny moments for the, re the residents of Greensboro, as well as for any visitors who might come to South Elm Street. While I appreciate the I'm not a curator shirts that Nick Marcells and would love to get one, I should also be honest in saying that it's in the education department of many museums that I have seen some of the most interesting and flexible curatorial work taking place. My own project, A Field Guide to Spatial Intimacy, which was part of the Book of Everyday Instruction chapter four, was first produced by the very same department that I'm calling out for letting go of its educators, the Museum of Modern Art. I was commissioned to do Field Guide for Spatial Intimacy by the education department, but I was commissioned as an artist. A Field Guide to Spatial Intimacy was a workshop-based performance project that uses the uh, sociological field of proxemics, the distances from which we expect or feel we need to stand from people in order to maintain culture and design. You can see in this image um, two of my participants standing at the social distance apart from each other. The spaces go intimate space, personal space, um, social space and public space, public space being 25 feet, social space 12 feet, personal space 4 feet, and intimate space 18 inches or a foot and a half. Oops, let's see if this video will play. Out of this workshop, and there's no sound in the video, so don't worry when you can't hear anything. Out of this workshop, my participants participated in a method of creating story tapes. I was able to find blank measuring tapes from a company called Lee Valley Tools in Canada, leave it to Canada to, cre to create all the good stuff, where people could write their own stories of social distance on what amounted to be exactly a 12 foot measuring tape. You'll see scrolling through the screen, a work by a woman named Paige who participated in the workshop, talking about the social distances that she is trying to cross between the people that she finds herself with and among. Now, of course, we did this in 2016. Social distance meant something different. It means something else to me now. 
I'll give you a second to watch the video. On the other side of this, I cannot say that there will be a reinvention of what we call the social, but I can say that there might be. Social behavior has been such a huge part of education that I think it's possible for us to forget that it's even there, very much like the good qualities of our partners that with the exception of extreme moments we can often take for granted. I think it can be hard to imagine as educators that anyone isn't having the level of conversational content that we've anticipated each day regardless of what we may be teaching. Recently, I've been working hard to formulate the idea of the second responder. First responders are those who are, and this is the actual de definition, designated or trained to respond to an emergency. But as anyone who's experienced a challenge or loss will tell you, emergency is not actually a moment. There's the initial incident, the accident, the diagnosis, the death, and in those moments, we generally know what to do. There's a flurry of action, a huge number of calls, practical details. And then that moment passes. The immediate work has been done. The phone stops ringing. This is where second responders enter the picture. In an ongoing condition of grief, who gives us the tools that we need to survive and grow? As Meryl Lederman Eucles asks in her famous Manifesto for Maintenance Art, 1969, after the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? While the second responder is not necessarily required to be the person who cleans up after the first responders, I want to hold on to the sense that what follows is as urgent and essential as what happens. I believe that both artists and educators are essential second responders. As second responders, how can we ensure that on the other side or sides of this moment, whatever they may be, we open up the space for the kind of flexibility to use institutions as a crack against what we wish to know about the world, rather than as an eggshell filled with assumptions or what someone else has decided we're supposed to know. We have been asked to let go of so much over the past few months although how much of that was ever really ours in the first place is also worth questioning. But I'm hesitant to ask anyone to shed more. Still, I'm excited for the potential of this time as a moment that shifts us out of what we have known, assumed, flourished in, and been exhausted by, to one that allows us to consider what we actually have at hand and how we might want and be able to share it with others. The old models do not serve us. That much is clear. I want to close not with my own words, but from words from a recent online teach-in with Indian novelist and journalist Arundhati Roy, who gave language to my commitment that looking closely as a practice may aggregate far more meaning than we know. Quote, what we are doing now counts as protest. To understand what is being done to us is the fundamental and foundational first step. I wish you peace and insight as you come to your own understanding. Thank you for looking more closely with me today and as you move throughout whatever world or worlds you find yourself within. I'm excited to hear your questions. Thanks. And let me join you back here, yes. Thank you, Chloe. Um, we've had a lot of chatter on the uh, chat board, so if you do have a specific question, please uh, uh, include it in there. Um, I think I'll start with some of the early chatter, which was an, an appreciation for some phrases that you used, like stressful pause. Um, there was another one. Oh, the, there was a lot about the physical distancing, too. I was wondering if physical distancing, especially as different from social distancing, if you wanted to comment on that to start. Sure. Um, so the sense of physical distancing, I think, is more appropriate to this time because the social does not only involve physical proximity and it sort of hasn't for a long time. 
And I think when we start to talk about social distancing, and I'm not the only person who said this, I don't even remember where I saw it first, but when we talk about social distancing, that seems like an invitation to forget about other people um, and to forget about how we can care for others and for ourselves during this time. Um, it seems to me, as much as I'm like within a nuclear family right now, it does seem to me also to be a return to the nuclear family as a protective form in the worst possible sense. <laughs> um, and I do want to think beyond what is here for me in this room or here in this house, but also for all of us to be able to think beyond these things in this moment, because we are going to require so much more from so many people and not always in ways where we'll be able to touch each other. So I'm choosing physical distancing to emphasize that it's about our bodies and we can say that we're still socially together, I hope in some ways. Which makes it maybe even harder when that physical distance doesn't allow you to do things like grieve together and- Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, some of the other questions that came up in comments. Um, Kinnerit, uh, who's actually a former president of, the, uh, of NICMER, chimed in at one point to ask what what is a museum and in terms of the uh, context of virtual experiences what do you think would be the value of authentic art artifacts and other objects in that context you know it's interesting to me because right now as much as we are like an artist and curator household here <laughs> so we have a lot of art and books and objects around us um, in our home but like to me, the idea of what is a museum is very much up for question. Um, I can say what it has been for me. I don't know what it will be. I don't think that museums know what they will be. I hope that they don't try to be what they were before because it's clear that that is only meant to withstand certain circumstances. And particularly like the maintenance of huge bodies of objects and archives, which I do think is historically valuable and of course serves me as an artist as I produce physical works, is also like undeniably a huge drain on natural resources. Um, so like, what do we do about that? I don't really know. Um, I love to touch things and interact with things and sometimes make things. A lot of the things that I make are not actually physical in form. I like talking my students through problems of making or you know, seeing a child discover what it is to touch something for the first time, all that good kind of stuff that you all probably have experienced or know about. Um, but I'm beginning to question whether or not we've sort of been putting stuff ahead of people in a lot of different ways and how we might seek to shift that in whatever the museum becomes. So I want to, I'm not calling for the destruction of anything, but just kind of like for that to be entering into our thoughts, um, especially as we can't go anywhere anyway, uh, and certainly not to a museum. You know, I haven't really enjoyed looking at most online exhibitions. Um, my graduate students were assigned to do a review of online exhibitions, and I have to say they were pretty consistently hilarious because <laughs> it, it really articulated the frustrating experience for people who like art and are inclined to do a lot of art viewing and art thinking to go through something that is virtual but sort of unthought. Um, I would love to see more online exhibitions of art that's actually for the web. And I would also like to say that there's tons of people who were doing that before this because it was the best place to look at web-based art was on the web. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question, but those are some thoughts I've been having. I've had some some thoughts, uh, you know, I'm on the more of the natural history side and um, for researchers, for uh, maybe for even some level of educators, there's a lot of online resources that are more about kind of the nitty gritty in the collection as opposed to the, the really public, you know, museum quality pieces mm -hmm. that are very important. And, and I'm sure there's the same on the, uh, the art museum side. Um, and it's great to see so many of those resources up, but it's, you know, is there a difference? And I'm, I'm guessing, yes, <laughs> but, uh, you know, is there a difference in uh, being there and experiencing the thing with others as opposed to seeing it on your screen? And can you replicate that, that kind of social uh, interaction that you get when you're on a date in a museum, for instance. Yeah, actually, I went on one of my first dates at the Museum of Natural History. Oh. <laughs> and the story tape that I made as part of Book of Everyday Instruction Chapter 4, the like example story tape, um, expresses the experience of that date where I had the 
suddenly, I mean, I was like 14. I had the shocking experience of like, oh, this person is about to kiss my face. Like, <laughs> what, what, what do I do? <laughs> and how surprising that was for me, particularly in a context where I felt so at home as the Natural History Museum. I don't think that's a replicable experience not least because I'm not 14 anymore, but you know, just in general, right? Those sense of surprise or doing something for the first time, um, that is what it is. It happens for the first time and then it kind of passes, but trying to figure out a way to call back those feelings into question as we seek to rebuild or reinvent is what feels important to me. Meredith uh, Wong is following up with uh, something interesting, I think here. So she, she typed out, uh, experiencing space and physical objects through multi-sensory interaction is so important for people with and without disabilities. Do you have any ideas on how we can bridge that idea virtually or those ideas? Sorry, can you ask me the question again? I was scrolling because I'm like <laughs> trying to find stuff, but I'm giving up on trying to find stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, She's talking about the, the in-person experience being that multi-sensory interaction. Yeah. Um, especially for people with, uh, with, no, sorry, not especially, but for people with and without disabilities. Sure. Um, you know, you, you can't, you think of a science center or a, a kid's museum or, or even a library that has a, an exhibit on, on maybe books that you can take out. Um, do you have any thoughts on how that could be bridged in any sort of virtual way is, is the question, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I, there's probably possibility for that. I'm not sure I'm the best person to speak to that, but there are people who have been working in virtual and augmented realities in ways that are um, quite oftentimes effective. I have mixed feelings about my own experiences in those worlds, but I can't deny that it's going to be important as a way of conveying multisensory experience. Um, I will also say like there's sort, of, there's sort of like that move towards technology, but then there's kind of the other move way back when, which is like packages and mail art, if we still have a postal system, are gonna become really interesting ways mm -hmm. to share sensory experience and it just takes more time. But that metric of spreading out time to me is also kind of a good thing. That we can't just guarantee that we could have something as soon as we need it, um, but have to take the time to assemble it, to receive it and to engage with it, I think offers a lot of possibility for learning and experience. It's an interesting, the, um... The, the mail used to be used for uh, a lot of, um, I'm blanking on the name of the thing, but when you're uh, kind of competing, uh, you know what, skip that, because I'm blanking on the name of the thing I'm trying to talk about. So um, Virginia actually followed up on what you were saying about uh, artwork that's made for online. Mm -hmm. she, she says she used to see a lot in the 90s and early 2000s. Can you point to any specific uh, spaces or example of artwork that's currently made specifically to be online? What I would do is actually go to the website Rhizome. I believe it's rhizome.org and they have an excellent archive and they will do far more uh, good work in this arena than I will in a short term. So they have all the resources that you need, maybe not all, many resources that you need. And then it is up to you to sort of start to identify what you wish was there and wasn't. You might be able to find it or you might be able to make it, but it's Rhizome that I would check out. As you were saying that, someone actually posted the uh, the link to that. So Thank that's, you. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, Marina uh, um, followed up actually on the, the post office. Uh, she's been utilizing the, the USPS to experience connection in art. She put out a call to her friends to create cat-related artwork for a cat art gallery in her den. She's been having a lot of fun, and now she has memories that she can cherish even after that this time. <laughs> Um, that's nice. Um, all right. I had some other questions from earlier. One, oop, my document. Here we go. Um, Leah Golubchik, a good friend, uh, wrote out, does trauma informed education and practice influence the second responder idea? Now, actually there was a lot of kind of buzz about second responder when you said that and people, uh, thanking you for, for mentioning them as, as such, but um, again, the uh, trauma-informed education and practice influence the second responder idea. Are, there, are they formally related? If not, where does that come from? Um, so the second responder idea is something that I and my partner have been reflecting on as we both sort of processed what we're best at doing during a crisis. Um, we're actually both quite, as it turns out, 
cool headed in an immediate crisis, like I sliced my finger open a couple of weeks ago. We were both pretty calm about that. But, um, you know, like beyond sort of small domestic jokes, right, we've been talking about where we really serve best um, with the skills that we actually have not being the people that we ideally want to be, because sometimes you can't become the biggest person in the world also when you're going through something very difficult. So using what you have, using what you know you're good at, what you know you can do, where do you best serve? Mm -hmm. um, I have not done any formal trauma education, but it is a funny secret part of my backstory that I wasn't planning to go to graduate school. And then there was the 2008 recession. And I was like, I guess I'm going to graduate school and I'm either going to get a degree in performance or I'm going to get one in trauma studies. Um, and I chose performance. <laughs> but I could have chosen trauma studies. And like I had an equal passion for both. Um, it's I'm laughing about it now because it feels like such a ridiculous thing to be choosing between. But I am interested in the ways in which certain elements of ongoing trauma actually affect our ability to listen or to engage with others. And I have dealt with that a lot through my performance and participatory artworks. So the answer is yes. But there was no like formal source of text or article or book that I was reading as I was putting together those thoughts. I'm gonna stick with the second responder idea for a moment. Something that struck me as you were talking was, you know, the first responders are very visible, um, not only physically, you know, they're shiny often and uh, wear reflective gear or, um, or have literal shields that are shiny. Um, could you talk about the visibility, perhaps, of second responders? Yeah, I, I think, um, hmm, I mean, we could make uniforms, but I'm, I'm hesitant to do so. In some places do have them, in fact, yeah. Yeah, um, and depending on who you are and like what you teach and who else would be included in a category of second responders, some of those people may already have uniforms that are just not acknowledged as second responders, right? So... I don't know that I necessarily need the second responder to be visible as an individual, but rather as almost a form of work or a form of like holding people up. Um, one of the things that I think about often is that a lot of the people who get the most public attention, it's not to say that they aren't working the hardest, but that there's often a lot of quite invisible work underneath or behind them that will never receive public attention. And that has good parts and bad parts. I don't think that everything benefits by becoming publicly recognized. I think that there are actually some things that flourish in quiet or can be kept safe or protected by quiet. And there are other things that um, definitely do better by coming to light, other things that need to be revealed, other things that need to be opened and discussed in a public way. So I think in the second responder concept, which I really have only been developing for a few weeks, um, I would want to consider what elements of that lend themselves towards public performance or recognition and what is really almost like a current that carries us. Ooh, interesting question just came in. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think it is, it is interesting to think about how visible you want to be as a, as a, a profession, as a, as a person. Um, but Corinne is asking how we define community when interactions are primary digital, primarily digital and virtual, and I think I have a good follow-up to that in a moment, but I'll let you take that first. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. How are you defining community beforehand, right? Oh, that's an interesting Because I don't, I can't actually take for granted that we have the same understanding of what a community might constitute. And what I've been trying to do is sort of list out for myself the things that I might have used to define community and seeing which one of those things are still true, right? Not everything goes away just because we're not in the same place as each other. And certainly, like, virtual communities have predated this. Um, you know, I, so I grew up, and I grew up impersonating being an adult as a teenager in AOL chat rooms. Um, I am not proud of this. I am also not ashamed, but like my sense of virtual community because I could type and like type faster and spell better than a lot of the actual adults in AOL chat rooms when I was a teenager. I had this like community of adults in who knows where doing who knows what when I was, you know, 12 or 13, right? And that's just one example of many virtual communities that have been highly successful in weird types of ways. Um, so it's like a question of what does it mean for you or what do you need from a community and what can be kind of held on to, maintained or developed in a different way under these circumstances. I was going to 
follow up with uh, kind of that that uh, these concepts and teaching without interaction, especially considering uh, you started your talk on inquiry and and how do you how do you do that inquiry without or with your community shifting so much? Uh, you can you can move you can move that community online. You can move that community into various virtual spaces. Um, have you had any experience with trying to move inquiry into that space? Listen, far and away, my best Zoom every week is with the six MFA students from Queens College who are in my MFA writing seminar. Um, it's not just that they're wonderful people, which they are, but I would say, and if any of you are here, you can disagree, but like, I would say we've been doing a little bit better online than we were doing in the classroom because what we were being asked to do in the classroom used the writing seminar model and like just sort of like put that on top of the studio class model. So it was a four hour writing class, which like no Oof. one can do, right? Like <laughs> completely impossible. I can't teach it. You can't learn it. Like, what do we do? They're not, again, they're artists who are learning to write. They are not writers who are used to workshopping, right? I wanna make that distinction clear. Um, and online, we've actually been able to have these two hour meetings where we're mostly just having lively conversations or occasionally actually reading things to each other, just texts that we've been looking at or other types of stuff. And then going back and doing the other two hours of work in other circumstances through um, Google Drive. Mm -hmm. And like that combination of things has allowed us to be together in a way that I've found actually quite special and not draining, as opposed to so many of the other online interactions I've been having, which are honestly in real life Zoom meetings that would have been phone calls or emails. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in kind of where we can expand what is possible and what kind of time frames we need to do that and what allows us to really be able to join a thing as opposed to overusing a tool just because we're panicking about the present. Thank you for that. I think uh, we've got about three minutes left. So okay. um, I wanted to end maybe, uh, unless your answer is real short, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, with Tara's uh, question, uh, kind of coming back to you to ask, uh, if you can talk about the process of developing a new idea for yourself and then how you develop it to share with others. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I am weird and I oftentimes I get these sort of phrases stuck in my head. Um, and I oftentimes will sort of start with a title. Um, hmm. And the title usually has a bunch of different meanings for me, but like the way that I'm dealing with it is by investigating the meanings of some of what those titles are. So for example, to use the overall project title of my current phase of work, Obligation to Others Holds Me in My Place, that is actually my definition of a family, right? And that has good parts and bad parts. Depending on the day, you're like, oh, that's dark. And on other days, you're like, I feel hugged um, mm -hmm. and everything in between. And then I'm also really like, I don't work in any particular form. I don't make paintings, I don't make ceramics. I pretty much have tried my hand at most other things in terms of artwork. I'm better at some of them than others, but I'm like pretty open. So even this idea of becoming a filmmaker and making a film is a new idea for me, but one that I'm going forth with, you know, crazy confidence, uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think as I'm, as I'm unpacking these meanings of these ideas, they also sort of start to develop formal, um, imaginings in my mind. And that is the part of being an artist that it's very hard to explain, but I'm sure many of you have had that experience that you start to picture something and then you sort of start working down the path to make it. And I do a lot of research. Um, and when I say research, I mean that I read things and watch things and look at archives, but I also speak with people, have workshops, have focus groups, um, do public interventions, public performances that tell me about a space. I do a lot of eavesdropping. Um, and all of those things are kind of like the materials that I use as my studio practice to put together a longer idea. My projects take, you know, it used to be two years and then Book of Everyday Instruction took three. And like now this project is going to take four, it looks like. So it, it takes a while for me to do a work. But at each phase of the project, there are also elements that are um, available. So Wayfinding, which is up in St. Nicholas Park, is actually part of Obligation to Others Holds Me in My Place. I look forward to uh, when I can get up there to going to see Wayfinding, in fact. Um, and I suppose, it, oh, I, I did want to acknowledge there are quite a few people asking 
uh, for speculation on how schools will change, how society will change. And I think, you know, these are all great questions that no one knows the answer to yet. Um, and uh, maybe we can come back to that uh, next year at our conference or in other discussions during the day. Yeah. So, in my scroll, I did see that um, Dia Vija asked a question that I would love to respond oh, to, please, actually, please, yeah. um, if we have a minute. Yeah. So um, Dia had asked, do I have thoughts on the pace of a second responder, considering that the first is urgent crisis response that implies a rapidity? And I would say that second responders do not, and this is very, very important to me, do not all respond at the same pace. That one of the privileges about being a second responder is that some of that second response is urgent, some of it is very slow, but the idea is that it's sustained. And so if you're imagining as, it, as a musical score, right, it's a kind of thing that's coming in multiple instruments at multiple registers to make the whole piece. There might be one long drone and a lot of staccato, I don't know, violins, but like it is a collection of things that works together. And that operating at multiple paces is what we need the privilege to do in order to serve each other well in the long term. And playing off that, the percussionist maybe only comes in two or three times in the piece, but is still a necessary part of that. Yeah. We've been living with a kid and an electric drum set, so I know how <laughs> you feel. <laughs> I'm thinking more of the timpani who only you know, <laughs> plays at the crescendos, not at the, uh, not throughout. Um, but yes, yes. Uh, so thank you, Chloe. And I want to, again, welcome everyone to the rest of the day. Uh, the networking session is uh, open all day, but currently uh, open as well. Um, we encourage you to check that out for the next couple of minutes. It's a way to connect with someone random uh, here. And then the sessions will be starting at about 1030. Um, so, uh, you can't hear it, but there is a, a round of applause going on right now, Chloe, to, for you. And, uh, we're glad you could join us today and stay safe in St. Louis. Thank you. Um, we look forward to seeing your movie. Thanks so much for having me, Brian, <laughs> and for everything that you've done to put this together. Thanks to everyone at NICMER and everyone who's enjoying your conference day. Have a beautiful, um, experience. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Uh, I'll, we'll see you all around uh, during the day.